Good morning and welcome to Carthage United Methodist Church. We're so thankful you decided to join us this morning. Whether you're with us live or whether you're joining on a later day or time, we're still all gathered together in the sight of our Lord to lift his high and holy name. Now, if you will join me in prayer. Almighty God, we come to you this day ready to praise you, to lift your name. May it go into the heavens and rain down on this community and beyond to lift up the spirits of all, to join us together as one body of Christ within this community, and to allow us to live within our salvation and redemption that comes directly from you, Lord. Lord, if you'll now guide us and lead us as we join in our prayer that your son taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation as we, as, and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
want to thank those of you that are passionate about giving to the ministries of Carthage United Methodist Church. And I also want to make sure that you know that the church has left the building. Ministry is happening throughout the community and beyond, even though we're not meeting in the church. If you are interested in giving to Carthage United Methodist Church, please note the ways that you can give listed right here on this screen. You can also call the office at any time or drop by on Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. We want to thank you, and we thank you for your gifts towards the ministries of Carthage United Methodist Church. Exodus chapter 20, verse 14, you shall not murder. Romans chapter 12, uh, verses 9 and 10. Love must be sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to another in life, honor another, one another above yourselves. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Once upon a time there was a man, and his name was Hezekiah. He walked with God both day and night, but he didn't want to die. He cried, oh, Please let me live on in these broken homes. God smiled down on Hezekiah and gave it 15 years ago. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Lord, I want to go to heaven, but I don't want to die. But I long for the day when I have no birth, but I love living here on earth. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. When Jesus walked upon this earth, he knew his father's plans. He knew that he must give his life to save the soul of man. When Judas had betrayed him, his father had heard him cry. He was brave unto his death, but he didn't want to die. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Lord, I want to go to heaven, but I don't want to die. But I long for the day when I have no birth, but I love living here on earth. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. My granddaughter spilled the beans this week. She was asked by Miss Nicole for Miss Nicole's Children's Church to read scripture for the video that airs right before this one. Now I hope you watch it because Miss Nicole pairs her message for the children with my message for the adults. So sometimes the simplest message is the best and you might enjoy that one and get more out of it than you do this one. Who knows? But nevertheless, I was trying to, to uh, 
quiz my granddaughter and see if she had actually remembered what she read. And I said, so what is that sixth commandment? And she goes, that shall not murder. She remembered. She said, it's Exodus 20, verse 13. She was a little sassy about it, but I was quite proud of her for knowing them. Now, we're going to explore this because it's a little bit more than just killing. It's not just thou shalt not kill. Murder is a big component about what we look at when we look at this commandment. But before we get into that, I want to talk a moment about what the difference between murdering and killing is. Because there is a difference. I was quite glad that she had learned it by saying thou shalt not murder. Because killing can involve hunting or um, having to fight in a war possibly. But murder usually involves vengeance or malice. There's some forethought there that, that causes us to harm someone. And in fact, if you look at the original language of that word that they used, what they're looking at is you should not kill someone without looking at the larger community and they agree that that's what needs to be done in that case. It's a punishment that the community sees fit. And that's what we want to look at is how can we live into this commandment, do not murder. But before we do that, I want to give you a quiz. Let's see how many of the first five you can remember. So the first one is, right, thou shall have no gods before me. The second is, don't make idols, right. The third is, let's not make the Lord's name insignificant or don't use the Lord's name in vain. The fourth is remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Keep that day set aside for God. And the fifth is honor your father and mother because they gave you life, your parents. And that fifth one is the one that bridges between the first four that teach us how to honor God and the last five which teach us how to honor others in the sight of God, those that God created. So now we're ready to work on those five, and the first of those five is thou shall not murder. And we will look at that as we move along. Now some of you are probably sitting there thinking that do not murder is kind of, duh. I don't, I'm not supposed to kill people, and this should be a really short sermon. But the truth is, there's a whole lot more to this. It's more about valuing the sacred, valuing the sacred worth of what God created in all of us and how we live together with our brothers and sisters in God, our created brothers and sisters, and respecting them as this image of God before us. So what we see happens later in Genesis chapter 4, Adam and Eve have a son named Cain, and then they have a son named Abel, and they grow up, and they have their own plots of land and their own things they're doing, and they're going to the altar of the Lord to give a sacrifice. Well, now Cain grabs some grain. He just grabs some of his grain, and he takes it up there, but Adam... He takes the firstborn of his herd, this really choice cuts of meat, and he takes that to the altar. Well, Cain gets jealous. He feels like Abel is showing out to God, and he throws a fit, and he kills his brother. He murders his brother. He doesn't, there's no trial, there's no jury, there's no conversation with the community. He just murders his brother. Well, God comes around and he sees Cain all upset. And he's like, what's wrong? Where's your brother? And Cain's like, I don't know. I'm not in charge of taking care of my brother. And God said, I hear the blood of your brother crying out from the earth. So what he's saying is, I know you've killed your brother. You're going to fess up? And so what he does to Cain, he gives him a consequence. Now, it's not really a punishment, but it's a consequence. And he tells him that since you can't operate within this community and you can't get along and you are going to just hurt people that don't act the way that you think you, that they should act and you're going to be vengeful, I'm going to set you outside of this community. You're going to be a homeless wanderer trying to forage for your goodness and your life the rest of your life. And Cain begins to throw another fit. And he's like, that's not fair because I'll be a marked man. People are going to come and they're going to try to kill me for being the one that killed Cain. And God said, no, I'm going to put a mark on you, a mark of protection that will protect you. And if anyone does kill you, they will be punished seven times. So fast forward to later. 
they have babies and they have babies and they have babies and Cain has babies and a few generations down there's one of his descendants named Lemek. And Lemek apparently within his DNA got that vengefulness and that revenge mentality that Cain had and he goes forward and he kills someone that wrongs him and so he is like but you know what God's going to protect me 70 times 7. This is a bold statement of, that shows the rebellion that lives in the lineage of Cain. It's this anger, it's this rebellion that makes you believe you have the right to harm others because you want what you want. And you're gonna get what you're gonna get and you're gonna do it however or by whatever means that you want to make that happen. That's what causes the murder rate in America to be about 7.5 out of every 100,000 people. It's when people believe that they can have what they want to have and it doesn't matter who they harm or hurt in the process. But Jesus takes the subject of murder a little further when he comes on the scene and he makes it more clear for us what it really means to murder. Jesus, in the, in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew recorded Jesus as telling us to not get angry and to not use vengeance. And then if we do that, we are murdering those people in spirit. And when I grew up, that was always told, I was always told not to be ugly. And that was no reflection on my physical appearance. It was more of a reflection on my inner heart. Treating people badly was treating them ugly. And it was treating them as ugly. And people in the image of God are not ugly. And that we are not to do that. And Jesus urges us to first put others before ourselves and to always forgive them for whatever they do. In other words, we're to treat others like who they are. A beautiful creation of God made in his image. Now in Matthew 18, 21, he takes this idea of forgiving people and not having vengeance and not seeking revenge even further. He says, forgive them 70 times seven. Now this is a nod back to the story of Lemek. He's basically saying, well, you know, Lemek said that God would protect him 70 times seven. Well, I'm telling you, we are going to be proactive and when people wrong you instead of murdering them and then God protecting you, I'm saying you forgive them not only seven times, but seven times 70. That comes from the parable of an unforgiving servant. And Peter says, well, then what if I, very boastfully, because he's Peter and a little competitive, I'll just forgive him seven times instead of the three times rabbis said you had to forgive people. And Jesus said, no. Take that number of perfection, seven, and multiply it by 70. In other words, infinity. Infinity to perfection. Because perfection is not keeping track of how often you forgive someone. You just keep forgiving. And remembering that forgiveness is not for them. It's for you. It's for you so that your heart is not resting in that vengeance and that revenge and that malice and that anger towards another, that your heart is staying clean and righteous and perfect, moving towards perfection and in love. And you're treating people with that image that God has asked you to treat them with. Paul tries to help us understand it a little better. He tags on to what Jesus said in this whole thought of murder and anger and vengeance. And he, he addresses it in the book of Romans to the church within Rome in chapter 12. And he says this, love others with genuine affection, honoring each other. When you murder people, you could murder their heart by being mean or ugly. You can murder their hope by taking away their hope and being, giving them, making them feel hopeless by putting obstacles in their way. To murder their confidence, you can murder someone's confidence by cutting them down and making them feel insignificant. You can murder their spirit by taking away their connection with God. There are so many ways. We can murder someone's reputation by gossiping about them and telling bad stories about them. 
if we actually look at every person as a true image of God and remind ourselves that that person is made in an image that reflects our almighty God, then how can we harm them or in any way? The founder of the United Methodist Movement had three rules. The first was do no harm. The second one was love in all ways and every way. And the third was stay in love with God. Now those are condensed versions. They were much longer and a little bit more wordy. But the do no harm I find interesting came first. Not love others, but to not harm others. That was more important. Now that is love but it's still more important to not harm. I asked Amelia what was the difference between murder and kill, and she said, well, I don't know that there's a difference. I said, well, how can we not hurt people? How can we not harm people? And she said, we can be nice to them. Amelia said it, and that's a beautiful thought for her. But for us adults, I wanna take it a step further. It's more than being nice. It's more than being kind. It's more than saying all the things that we have to say so that we look pretty on the outside. It's about not being ugly on the inside. It's about finding those people that are harder to love. It's about making sure that we don't do things that could harm, potentially harm someone else. It's about not driving fast so that we cause a wreck that causes someone else to die. It's that far rooted back to who we are and what we do. Everything we do, we are accountable for. Everything we say, we are held accountable for. And if what we do and what we say, the actions we take cause harm for another, then that harm is murdering a part of that person. God was very clear about not harming his creation, not harming this humanity that he created. He knows we're broken. He knows we're flawed. He knows we've done wrong. But you know what? He loves us in spite of that. And he is working in concert with the Holy Spirit and Jesus to bring about a full and a complete perfection and redemption. But if we are a stumbling block in, their, in God's way, by harming that person so that they can lose connection with God because they feel less than themselves or we hurt their physical body or we hurt their spirit or we hurt their emotional body. We are murdering them in some way. I want you to take just a second and I want you to close your eyes with me and I want you to think, is there someone that I'm holding ugliness in my heart for? Is there someone that I'm not showing on the inside what I'm displaying on the outside? Close your eyes and think of that person. Now I'm gonna ask you a favor. I'm gonna ask you to carry that person in your heart all week long. Carry that person in your heart in such a way that you lift them up and you give them strength. Maybe you write them a letter. Maybe you call them. Maybe you just are at a place where all you can do is pray for them right now. But find a way to honor the image they carry that is rooted in your God instead of harming them. First, do no harm. I want you to make this week be the week that you no longer create murder in the lives of another. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come to you today so thankful that we are created in the image of God and let us take that thanks further and be thankful that others are created in that very image. Let us seek to lift up, let's seek to uphold, let's seek to feed and nurture and love and do no harm. It's in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen.
It's a cry of my heart when affliction strikes Or when swarming in worry can sing my nights It's my joy when breakthrough finds